a tina koto kato a turu kinamate hare 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 atura ke mihi ke te iwi kaianga ki a rangatane ki a tato itau nei kiora tina koto tina koto tina tato kato. Well, greetings to you all uh, this evening, and thanks for taking your busy time uh, to, to come and attend our very first Creative Cities Conversation. My name is Dave Charnley, I'm the Senior Urban Designer here at PNCC, and this evening we're very excited to be able to offer you uh, this talk from Craig uh, regarding the carbon landscape. Albeit under COVID Level 2, um, that hopefully next time we have our next conversation that we can be a little bit more, uh, less formal, uh, under more favourable conditions. The Creative Cities Conversation is a new programme of public talks we're delivering to the city. Uh, we recognise that tonight's format may not be completely right and we want to hear from you uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, we'll be sending a survey and we want to sort of fine tune this talk and, and improve it over time as we keep delivering the programme. We're also interested to have suggestions from you as the public of people who may be uh, interesting critical friends or thought, le thought leaders who can offer a, a different perspective on creative city making. So if you know someone that uh, could lend their selves to the program, please see me after uh, the presentation tonight. So what is a creative city? Uh, it's a place which creates the conditions where people and organisations can think, plan and act with imagination to solve our problems and develop new opportunities. In 2013, we had Charles Landry visit Palmerston North and he undertook our first Creative Cities Index report, resulting in the report comfortable or captivating. In this report, he offered up six recommendations about what we could do as a city, that being improve our strategic leadership, create a city coalition of partners working together more, focus on interdisciplinary working and horizontal thinking, the quality of our urban design of our spaces and places uh, needs to be lifted and taken more seriously, how we live, move, connect and grow, our level of visible city life and the look and feel and the experience of our city. We need to focus on entrepreneurship, the antidote to complacency. We've got one of the youngest populations in New Zealand. What conditions are existing here for experimentation, risk-taking and innovation? What are we doing to make our young talent stay here, or are we happy to watch our young talent leave? The last one is city perception. How we are defined as a city, is it by the outsiders? Do they define us, or are we going to start defining ourselves and our city? We need to grow up, we need to act less as a town, more of a city, and we need to have the confidence to make the virtues of our cities more visible. We need to start telling our own stories, back out of the city and back to each other. But the news isn't all bad, and for the last six or seven years, we've actually been making really good progress in these areas, and the city is now on much more of a strategic journey to lean into the feedback and take it as a positive thing. So why carbon? As we know, the climate is changing as a result of human greenhouse gas emissions. It's bringing changes to long-term weather patterns and there's increasing frequency of drought and flooding in the region. We need to understand and adapt to the impacts of climate change and we need to work to reduce both the Council's greenhouse gas emissions as well as the city's greenhouse gas emissions. If we are to meet the national zero carbon target by 2050. Our eco-city strategy sets a target of 25% citywide reduction in carbon emissions and we know from our 2018 citywide inventory that approximately 5.7 tonnes of carbon is emitted per person in the city. Our biggest emitters being transportation Below that, stationary energy, agriculture, waste, and a small percentage of industrial. 
How we address our carbon emissions is both a leadership challenge and it's also a challenge that we need to change. Collectively, we need to do more, and now's the time for us to start applying a creative mindset to think and act both individually and collectively to solve this problem together. I'd like to introduce you to the Palmy Climate Calculator. This was recently launched uh, this month, and it's an example of a creative approach to addressing some serious issues and, and topic areas. The model takes our city's carbon inventory and projects how our emissions will change over the next 30 years. The tool invites you as users to make changes to the city future's policy levers, to see how your choices affect our city emissions over time and create your ideal level of emissions. This is a great example of creativity applied where this is interactive, user-friendly web tool we can all use. It helps us understand our city emissions, emissions in context. It helps us to see the relative impact of different technologies and scenarios and how they interrelate. And it allows us to gather your views on which scenarios you support or consider most likely, likely which will help develop a low carbon roadmap for the city. I encourage you all to go and, and log on to the Palmy Climate Calculator and have a play around. And so that leads us to tonight's speaker, Craig Pocock. Although Craig doesn't know this, I first met Craig many years ago when I was a young, budding graduate at Lincoln University. Uh, I think Craig was our guest speaker for our fourth year professional practice paper. And from memory, I think Craig had just recently returned from overseas where he'd been working uh, in India, I believe, um, looking at how design of, on, of stormwater systems in, in developing communities uh, across India is being applied. Um, I remember at the time I was really, my mind was open to his critical approach to sustainable design and highlighting the management of water as a really important thing that we must hold as landscape architects. Over the last couple of years, I've had the chance to get to know Craig on a more personal level, and I've been impressed by his driving and passion towards his work and his understanding of the carbon implications of how we design, build, and manage our cities. Uh, Craig is a principal architect at Becker and a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects. He's an experienced practitioner, educator, researcher, and has practiced globally, both in practice and in teaching. Um, he's a, a leading uh, national figure in, uh, and thought leader in industry sustainability and in 2017 was nominated into the International Federation of Landscape Architects Advisory Panel on Sustainability and Climate Change. Uh, Craig continues to develop his research on the carbon landscape as well as publish on current issues within the industry. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me warm pleasure to welcome Craig to the stage to present his talk on the carbon landscape. All right. Thanks, Dave. Grab that. Awesome. Tēnā koutou katoa. This is, uh, I appreciate you all coming out. This is probably one of the most unusual seating patterns I think I've ever <laughs> presented to. And uh, over the years, I've presented to a few places, from, from, I guess, Montreal to Melbourne, Rio to Kuala Lumpur. Really happy to add Palmy to that list. Um, the, the carbon landscape really just come from a conversation in a bar where there was a conversation about whether there was any real carbon cost to landscape architecture. And of course, the answer was probably not. But, you know, it just came from a conversation in a bar. And the outcome really I thought was going to be a pretty short conversation turned into 15, 16 years worth of independent research, which was somewhat unexpected. And if I realised it was going to do that at the time, I probably wouldn't have taken it on. Um, the carbon landscape simply looks at... Um, oops, that's working. Um, simply looks at the carbon cost of landscape architecture and urban design. And I guess it's counterintuitive because when you think about landscape architects, you know, our role often is around environmental protection, environmental enhancement, community um, uplift. 
And so it's really counterintuitive to think about the idea that potentially there's some negative impact in, from an environmental perspective of what a landscape architect would do. So I get why the question wasn't asked. And I guess it was kind of, a, in some ways, a, a little bit of an unpopular question to, to ask. And the question I was asking was, if you considered the, um, the carbon impact of um, what we do and put it on a stage, no, it seems to be, sorry. If you looked at the, the carbon impact of what we do and put it on a stage of, of, of um, carbon, how do we stack up? So if you think about all the good things we do around wetlands and communities, it's, it's quite easy to see ourselves as a positive steward of the environment. But if we add carbon and climate change and the atmosphere to the mix, how would we still stack up? Um, and I assume probably OK. I wasn't sure. But I wondered how we would stack up. And if there was an impact to what we do, then what are the things we do as a design industry, particularly around urban renewal, where we're, we're continuing to redesign environments, what impact does that have? Now, the carbon landscape didn't really come from a New Zealand conversation, and, and it, it sort of helps to have a little bit of a background about why I even picked this up. So as a young landscape architect coming out of New Zealand, which is sort of the, the land of milk and honey, it's really hard to sort of question environmental impacts of what we do, because predominantly everything's green and there's water and things grow and we have high quality soil. So I didn't start thinking about the potential of, of environmental impact of what we do until you get into an environment which is harsh. And so my second job out of school was I went to Jordan and ended up building five hotels in the desert. And one of those hotels was on the Dead Sea. And so the Dead Sea, in case you don't know, is 600 metres below sea level. Incredibly, uh, the seawater is about 27% salinity. Normal seawater is about three. Incredibly difficult, toxic environment. And my job was to, as a landscape architect who'd never been to the Middle East before, was to plant uh, 300,000 plants. And uh, so I spent a year on the Dead Sea um, doing this project for a five-star international, well-known hotel. And it was the process of doing this in this very harsh, hot environment with no soil, no water, it hadn't rained for eight years, that I start questioning what I was doing and why I was doing it. And the very first time I started to really question it was when the first trucks of soil came down from Amman, down the Dead Sea Valley, to drop soil on the ground so we could plant plants. And when I found out that soil came from Syria, because there is no soil in Jordan, so they went to the northern border of Jordan where it touches Syria, and they were taking some of the little reserves of good farmable production soil for a, a private five-star hotel. And it never clicked on to me, you know, really the impact of that until I started seeing it literally being laid out in front of me. After that, we then planted 300,000 plants that required 80 cubic metres of water a day to keep them alive in a place that hadn't rained in eight years and that the local villages didn't have reticulated water. And when I left, they were talking about damming the Wadi Munjab to supply water to the next four or five hotels that were going to be built on this site. Because once you show success, and we showed success, right? We got, we got it to grow, and it was like a hothouse, so it grew really fast. The minute you show success, that environmental damage just got duplicated and duplicated and duplicated and duplicated. And so it was the very first time as a landscape architect I started getting my head around that it was possible to be on the wrong side of the environmental ledger, which was against everything and anything I'd ever been taught. After Jordan, I ended up in the West Bank. And, and so what was interesting about the West Bank is that it was a really strong tie between resources, both water and land, and social uplift of community. And so in the West Bank, we were building a, another hotel for the Palestinian Authority. And, but the hotel focus was really around increasing skills, bringing in uh, economic drivers, and also to change the perception of how the Palestinian people were perceived internationally. And so it had a much better feel about it because it had these social and economic community drivers that the Jordanian hotels didn't have. 
And so it became really transparent to me really, really quickly how important master planning and land and resource planning had a positive effect on the social and economic out outlook for a community. So I went from the West Bank because the second Antifada kicked off. And so we almost got the hotel 99% built about three weeks away from opening. And the second Antifada kicked off and it didn't open for another five years. So I went to India and I ended up working in India for three years. And it was a whole series of villages. I, I had a, a client who had a near-death experience, found God, brought 10,000 hectares of land, tried to work out what to do with it, had seven villages on it, and he just didn't know what to do with all this resource that he just had and why he'd even bought it. And so my role was to look at master planning the entire catchment. And what was interesting about it, and it wasn't until I'd spent a lot of time commuting to India back and forth, but I realised there was a really strong connection between the kids in the school and the level of education they were getting and their access to water. And so in summer, the kids would go right up to the top of the mountains where the springs were and spent the entire day carrying water. And so the, the role of this project is a giant reforestation project and we, we built these check dams and we recharged the groundwater table that had a direct effect on the wells, increased the water in the wells, increased the level of time that the kids spent in school. And so I've got, I, I came from a background where landscape architecture was around aesthetics and making things sort of circulation and how things looked, to all of a sudden understanding the performance and economic and social development and education connections between what we do and the positive impacts that it can have. After India, I went to New York, and New York was really interesting because the EDC, so the Economic Development Council of New York, required every project to be at a very high level of sustainability. And doing best practice wasn't enough to win projects. And so I ended up working on these large projects where the design and development firms had their own think tanks built into their own you know, firms because best practice wasn't going to win the job. They were always trying to up their game based on research and data to try and uh, win the bigger project. So all of a sudden, the free market, depending on how the client wrote the brief, the free market was driving research. It wasn't being driven by academia. It wasn't being driven by research tanks. It was being driven by the market trying to win jobs. And there's some real value in that. So I came back to New Zealand. I thought this was all really interesting. Came back pretty excited, still pretty young, I guess. And I said to the community, look, you know, did you know you could do this and this and that's connected to this and we should be doing this bit over here? And somehow, because somehow I let it slip that I thought there was, a, there was a, potentially a significant impact in what we do and the carbon cost. And, um, and that was because in India and New York, I'd met engineers who were carbon calculating out the cost of buildings, not the energy system, but the actual building of buildings. And I was like, huh, oh, if you can do that for a building, can you do it for landscape? And so I mentioned this. That wasn't really that popular idea. And so I got this letter. Got a few letters, actually, to be honest. We got this letter, and one of them, one of the statements in the letter was, look, there is no significant carbon footprint to what we do as landscape architects or urban designers. And even if there was, surely all the plants that we plant offsets the carbon cost of what we do. I thought that was kind of an interesting question. Now, I've learned over the years that if you're going to test out an idea that might be slightly controversial, it's best to use yourself as the example. So what I did is I sat down with a, a young student and I pulled all the old plans for the last 14 years of my projects. Because in those days, we actually had plans. So there's a bottom drawer. I pulled the plans, slapped them down, and started to look at what the carbon footprint of my career was. So I figured I was probably the best person to use as a scapegoat on this. So I looked at my career. And I did it in a really, really simple, stupid way. I simply looked at four materials. I didn't look at the whole carbon footprint of the entire project every nut and bolt, not how it was built. I simply picked four major materials from my job. So concrete, asphalt, timber, and steel. And there were internationally accepted numbers for those. So what we call an LCA, or a life cycle assessment number, that gives you a carbon number. And so I simply just crunched the numbers. There was also, um, and I can't remember where the office one comes from, but there was a, a calculator for energy use within an office. And BA, the British Airways, had a carbon calculator for flights. So I just crunched a bunch of numbers, added them up, 
And it came out at just under 16,000 tonnes of carbon. Now, keep in mind, if you looked at that last list, I wasn't very exciting. Like, a lot of those jobs were playgrounds, car parks, there's a couple of hotels, but generally they weren't very exciting jobs. They weren't what I would argue is really intense urban design, carbon heavy projects. They were pretty middle of the road stuff, still pretty young. And yet, that was a carbon cost of almost 16,000 tonnes. So I thought, all right, well, it doesn't matter because, you know, I've done a whole lot of planting. So that will certainly just offset it all. And so I'd worked in India, like I mentioned, and, and dealing with that, that whole water catchment with those check dams and reforestation. So a whole lot of people were involved in that reforestation, and we planted over 50,000 trees. Now, theoretically, I should have taken that 50,000 trees and divided them up by the number of people and just taken my allotment. I ignored that. I just took all the allotment for myself. So I simply took the whole carbon credits for myself and applied it to the equation. Didn't help me a lot, right? So those 50,000 trees had a carbon offset of about 500 tons. I was almost 16,000 in debt, and the, and the offset of 50,000 trees was only about 500 tons. It meant that I was uh, 15,400 still in debt. And at the time, I remember looking at carbon credits and seeing if I could buy my way out of it, and that wasn't affordable. And certainly planting my out of, way out of it wasn't going to work either. So I went back to the, the design community and I said, look, this is kind of interesting. If, you, if I've got a carbon debt of 1,100, what's your carbon debt? So at the time, so I decided I'd show them. So at the time, there were 596 registered landscape architects. This isn't the unregistered people. This isn't the sort of do-it-yourself or on the side. This is registered landscape architects. So these numbers are conservatively low. I said, all right, well, as a design community, let's multiply your membership by my 1,100 tons, which again is conservatively low. What's your carbon footprint? And it came out at 655,000 tons of carbon every single year for that industry of less than 600 people. And it kind of seemed like a big number, but it's a kind of like a so what number. So what do you do with that? What does that really mean? How do you visualize what that means? And so I decided to talk to my cousin who's in forestry and work out how many trees you'd have to plant to offset that number. And it was certainly more than I could fit in my backyard. So 71 million trees to offset one year of carbon footprint for 600 designers. 600 landscape architects. We're not talking about architects and civil engineers. We're talking about the little fluffy green landscape architects. 71 million trees. How much land? There are 238,000 hectares of land every single year you would have to reforest to offset the design industry's carbon footprint. And keep in mind, this is landscape. We're not talking about buildings. We're not talking about skyscrapers. We're not talking about concrete bridges. We're simply talking about the stuff around those buildings and those objects. So, you know, I don't know that that message went down particularly well, but I thought it was interesting. So then I went overseas and started talking about this. And interestingly, it didn't go down that well in America either. Um, I worked out what their carbon footprint was, and there was a letter of complaint in the ASLA newsletter. So, but anyway... 2005 was worth a crack. But this is fundamentally the problem. It's not that we're bad people and bad designers, but the carbon cost of the materials that we traditionally use is so big and so heavy, it is almost impossible for the natural environment ever to offset it. There's such an imbalance in those costs. So often you'll hear about, look, you know, we've got a carbon neutral project. What this tells me as a landscape architect is that it is almost impossible, if not impossible, to design a carbon neutral project. And that's landscape, that's not even buildings. So there's no point pointing out problems unless you can point out solutions. And the way to understand what the potential solutions was, was simply to break down where I thought the carbon costs were. And so I looked at where the carbon costs sat within the office, within building and implementation, within the urban renewal process and within maintenance. And the short answer is that we can be much more efficient about the way we run our buildings and we can change our light bulbs and we can get a few electric cars and that's all good and you should do that, but it's not the bit that makes the most difference. The thing that makes the most difference is the built environment and that's the one that we, we need to manage. And so the highest carbon cost that's in that implementation and material sector 
And then if you accept that that's where the highest cost sits, then you really don't want to replace it very often. You need to design for enduring landscapes. And then that maintenance, right? So depending on how you've designed that thing, whether it be a building or, or a landscape or an urban design, you've built in a maintenance regime that goes on and on and on for the entire life of that project. So depending on how, even though it might not be huge, depending on how wide you've made that carbon cost, it goes on for forever. And so it's a really big part to consider. All right, so let's just do a really quick crash course on how to understand this. So the way we think about embodied energy or carbon is through LCAs, which I've mentioned before. And generally, a really easy way to think about it is the less something is refined and produced, the lower the carbon cost. So gravel and cut stone has a lower carbon cost than concrete and steel. So just think, the more time something spends in a factory, the higher the carbon footprint. It's probably all you need to know at this point. But that's just the material the actual methodology of how you actually build a site or a building, all those machinery hours and waste, et cetera, also pays into that calculation. And once you start understanding what happens below the ground, so you can't just count the veneer, right? What you, once you start understanding what happens below the ground, that's kind of interesting, because you start questioning some of the sustainable devices that we use in urban design. And for me, one of the classics is the, the rain garden. So here's you know, a rain garden that's been around for 10 years. It's green. It's, it's incredible. Um, it offers you know, really um, great aesthetics. And I love the fact that it's using a bunch of natives. And as you walk past, you know, there's a, a six inch drop to a garden surface. And it filters that water, and we're done. And it looks benign. But those are the images below the ground, and I didn't ever think of this. This didn't cross my mind until I saw one of these things under construction and realised that to build these rain, these rain gardens, this one, not the only one, but this one, is it had about a 400 mil slab of concrete with 80 mils of, of stone paving, epoxy resin on with steel edges. And so there's a real question around the amount of work that rain garden does and whether it's enough to offset the environmental cost the atmospheric cost of that rain gun. So there's fundamentally an equation to do here somewhere. So now I'm seeing it more and more recently. So we are now starting to pave entire streets from building face to building face in concrete, and then glue paving to it and your steel edges. Entire streets. And so that's layer upon layer upon layer of carbon stacked. So how do we understand this? So I've become more interested in working out some way to do an urban calculator where we can start, you know, a council or a, a client, a campus could start saying, look, we've got three design options here, A, B, and C. How do you understand what the carbon cost of those options are? And so what you simply do is we, we created a 100 square metre, right, 10 by 10. Not too big. 100 square metre uh, example of typical New Zealand designs, and you explode it. And you pull each component out, and then you work out the carbon cost of each one of those components, and then you just put them together, add them up, and you get a carbon cost per 100 square metres. While you're doing it, you might as well add the financial cost in as well. And uh, so we, we looked at, you know, because we had all those quantities, we looked at, you know, standard New Zealand costs, Christchurch costs, and Auckland costs, just to give us a feel for not only the carbon cost of something, but the financial cost. And what I was really interested to see is whether they tracked each other. Because if they track each other and you can make carbon savings, that means you can make financial savings. And I just kind of wanted to understand if that happened. So, what we did is we took, we took about 10, but I'm only going to show you five. Five examples of stock standard New Zealand urban design that could be applied to any city in New Zealand. And to make this to make some sort of sense so you can make comparisons, I picked the, the, what I call the, the business as usual. This is your good old paving sitting on a bit of AP40, a bit of sand, and this is the way we've been building unit paving for decades, if not hundreds of years. So this is the sort of detail I was seeing in the Middle East that was 500 years old. So this is, I think, fair enough to say it's the business as usual. So the business, as usual, had a, a, a carbon baseline of 2.5 tonnes of carbon per 100 square metres and a material cost of just over $2,000 a square metre. So that's cool. 
Right, that's great. It gives us the baseline. That red line now represents that baseline. So this is a pretty functional, right? This is the one we like. This is what you've got around Jaw City where you've got the, the tar seal or the asphalt in the road. You've got the good old curb and channel. You've put a bit more money into that pedestrian realm, that public realm area where people get to enjoy it a little bit more. And so you get that pretty good looking piece of design, but also really straight out functional. And it has, at 1.3, a cheaper carbon cost per square metre than the business as usual, and the material costs are cheaper as well. So let's go through this, right, the rigid. So you'll see, you know, you'll see these designs wherever you walk in the cities. So the rigid is a good old in situ concrete with a bit of reinforcing steel, um, pretty standard piece of design. From the baseline, we start to shoot up. 11 tonnes of carbon per 100 square metres, 34,000 or, or three, you know, about 3,500 a square metre to deliver. So if we just keep shooting through the frugal, good old rain garden now, we've, we've thrown one in, a bit of asphalt on either side, a bit of concrete holding it all up. Um, this is, you know, examples built in Christchurch. And the rain garden is cheaper than the baseline, uh, both in carbon and financially. Oh, the deceptive. Deceptive's a classic, where you've got a bit of concrete paving on one side, and on the other side you've got the nice gravel, and it gives you that nice feel-good got a green credential sort of design because the gravel you assume is low carbon, so we're all good. But these rain gardens are fully lined with concrete or CMU block or concrete block, so they're completely lined bathtubs of concrete. And that's where the carbon cost is deceptively hidden below the ground. So the deceptive getting in about 16 tonnes of carbon per 100 square metres in 22,000 or just over 2,000 a square metre. And the final is my favourite, the carbon deluxe. The carbon deluxe is the layer upon layer upon layer of carbons. This is the street of concrete with reinforcing steel, steel edges, and uh, paving stuck to it. And so it does that nice job. You get, the, you get the beautiful rain garden, but it comes out at the highest cost. It's 16 tonnes of carbon per 100 square metres and almost 4,000 a square metre to deliver. Now, I know that just I can see you, you know, this is just around numbers and it's kind of hard to visualise, right? So if you want to visualise it, how do we visualise it? So keep in mind when I talk to you about the next diagrams that we're only talking about 100 square metres. And if you go back to my original letter of observation, um, it said that no matter what we design in the urban environment, all the green stuff that we plant balances it out so it doesn't matter. So here we go. Here's a picture of 100 square metres whole lot of green stuff in there to balance it out. Let's look at what that looks like. So, the red square on the screen is all, everything's drawn to scale. The red square on the screen is 100 square metres. The yellow square at forestry standard, plantation forestry standard, is the amount of hectares and the number of trees you would have to plant to offset 100 square metres. All right, so what do we start? The frugal, all right, so almost 90 trees, 98, uh, 89 trees, 0.3 of a hectare to offset 100 square metres. Pretty functional, gets a little bit bigger, 149 trees. The business as usual, which is our stock standard urban design that we use, and actually Palmy has used in your stage one. It's 277 trees for every 100 square metres of streetscape that you've built in this city. So you need to be offsetting almost a hectare of land for every 100 square metres. We start getting a bit excited around the rigid. At 1,215 trees per 100 square metres, over four hectares of land. Get into the deceptive, we're, we're jumping up there at 1,747 trees, 5.82 hectares of land for 100 square metres, just, just so we know, we're talking about maybe a quarter of the room. Right? So 1,700 trees to offset the paving surface for a quarter of a room. And then the carbon deluxe, slightly higher but not too much higher. So it's good news, right? Because the good news is that there's data, right? So we have the ability to do design and design to be driven by data. And we've, this information is really available, you know? Um, my wife's a lawyer and she, she quotes to me that ignorance of the law is no defense, or is no defense of the law. And so this information is really available and actually you're, you're busy doing your own carbon calculators now anyway. 
But it feels to me as a designer and a person who has the pen on that piece of paper making the decision about the material and the design and those cross sections, the carbon cost of that sits on me. And so I think the project manager, the civil engineer, the landscape architect, the urban designer that's designed this, whatever way you decide to go, you own it because you're the one that's making those decisions. And so you can make a decision on either side of that line, but whoever makes that decision, you own. So if we understand that there's a hell of a lot of cost sitting in implementation, like it's massive, you can never ever offset it, you're never gonna plant your way out of it, right? So you, as a community, decide you want this space, you build this space, the next logical conclusion is that space has to last a really long time. You want it there for centuries, not decades. And so I want to talk about urban renewal, because urban renewal in New Zealand is kind of interesting. So just to be clear, when we do urban renewal, whether it be Cathedral Square or somewhere else, urban, the cost of building that urban space, and you rip it out every 30 years and rebuild it again, that's compounding interest. Do you understand how that works for a bank? It's kind of that way for carbon as well. So every time you have to build another tier of carbon because there was a fundamental mistake in the way it was designed or the material that was selected or it didn't meet the functional requirements of the space, the community and the next generation keep paying that cost that you're laying down. And I think it's been interesting, I think part of the reason why we get urban renewal in New Zealand is we really focus and reward pattern making. For whatever reason, as, as, as a design industry, we really like patterns. And if you look at some of the more mature urban environments around the world, they don't put patterns on everything, but we really reward patterns. And the problem with patterns is they are fashion driven. So in the 90s, we had the Main Street movement. And you know, if you were in Blenheim and your, your lights had to look like uh, grapes, is what they did. Tapo had to have leaping trout, and uh, Fokitani had uh, you know, sunshine things. All of a sudden, you weren't a real city unless you had some cool sort of branding. I don't know who came up with this idea or who sold this, but they did it really well. You can drive from here to Auckland and go through a whole lot of small towns and see a whole lot of branding and pattern making. And the problem with it is that age is bad, right? Because pattern making, like all patterns, change. But pattern making is not the only not the only fashion that we as designers tend to follow. And so, you know, there was a period there where we said, look, you know, roads and streets were bad, main streets were bad, let's pull them out, let's replace them with pedestrian areas. And then a decade later, 15 years later, we're like, oh, that doesn't quite work, let's put the roads and stuff back in. And so there is a design fashion that gets sold as well. And this is a really interesting one. This is, this is Manukau Square, right? They pulled out the road, which is where the red arrow is, and built a beautiful green area with lots of planting and uh, some areas to play in. And it was considered the best design in New Zealand. So the George Malcolm Award is only given out once. It's not given out every time. It's only every two or three years. And maybe it's not even given out every, every each award ceremony. This one, the George Malcolm Award, well, this was considered the best. Only one project, the best. It lasted less than 18 years before it was pulled out, the road was put back in, and they put more paving, more planting, more grass, and more areas to play, right? And that came at an incredible cost to not only the community, but to the next generations that are paying that carbon cost. And so for me, avoiding that urban renewal process is absolutely key. And so part of it is around designing and being very clear about real functional spaces and about you know, clever use of materials and, 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 and um, having good program because you want to avoid this at all costs. And it can be done, right? And these half those places I've lived in. And these, I know these places exist. And those old stones are worn smooth from people walking over them. And what do these places have in common? And you can kind of see it in the picture. They have tough, enduring material. They're flexible material that can be pulled up, maintained, fixed, and put back down. But they're also simple, plain materials. The people in the culture make the space. 
not the pattern on the paving. And so in, in front of the gate of India or the Lion's Gate in Jerusalem, there is no hibiscus flower or jumping trout. It's simple. The people make the space. And yet for, for, for designers, I think we often feel we only get rewarded and win the commission, and I hear this from clients, when you've created pretty patterns and paving. And I think that comes at a cost. So I think the challenge for New Zealand is to work out where our 100-year-old spaces are. And I tell you, there's not a lot. And actually, I was just looking at the photos of your square 55 years ago where I had a railway through it. So, you know, I don't know where Palmy's 100-year-old spaces, you've been here for more than 100, year old, 100 years, where are your 100-year-old urban spaces? So I get that sometimes spaces look old and a bit grungy and, and communities feel better when you put a bit of money into them and you refresh them and you make them sparkly again. And that comes at a real financial cost and a carbon cost. And before you pay that cost, it's worth testing out the performance of that space with a bit of social programming. So this is, this is in Mexico City. So this is where I was a couple of Christmases ago, uh, walking through here with my family. And we come across this grungy, grungy square. And it wasn't winning any design awards, that was for real. Uh, it had average planting, the trees were, um, you know, average, the, the paving was still hanging out. It's probably, you know, a few decades old, but it's still looking good. But it was pumping. It was awesome. There were big groups of, of people dancing, and there was tacos and beer for sale at 10 a.m. in the morning in a public space. I'll let that sit with you for a minute. Beer and tacos at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So I think there probably were more people there than in church that day. There were people selling shoes and clothing, uh, zoot suits, and there was just this whole group of people dancing in a space that was kind of grungy and they didn't care and it didn't matter. And so my point is, I think before we pull out the bulldozers and replace spaces and pay that carbon cost and those financial costs, let's spend a year doing a bit of programming around that space and see if we can get that engagement with the community back into it before you pay the costs. And this is not unusual, this is done around the world. So New York, Brooklyn Bridge Park, I had a brief involvement with this. And it's a really benign space, actually. Um, it's built from some of the material from the Twin Towers. Um, it's just basically pretty plain paving, bit of concrete, bit of grass. Uh, it's, it's a very flexible space. It's, again, aesthetically, you know, okay. It's not, you know, full of patterns and shiny stuff. But what it has is a really clever social programming that went on every day of the week, uh, every day of the year. And they had everything from pop-up swimming pools and bars to speed dating in a public space. And so you don't have to look at New York to, to understand how that works. I mean, you know, you only have to look at Christchurch and the pressure that was in post-earthquakes and how much good work they did around um, social programming of spaces to even test out what those spaces should become in the future. And so I really would... I really think as both designers, I think as a designer morally and from a, from a sustainability perspective, when a client comes to me to talk to me about refreshing spaces, I should be talking to you about social programming of that space to test the design ideas before we rip it out and bring the bulldozers in. So we want to avoid that urban renewal as much as we can. All right, third and final, the maintenance conversation. It's really interesting talking to councils when you talk to them about their, their balancing up of sustainability and carbon and energy use, and you say to a council, all right, so what are you doing? And they say, all right, well, we're, we're on this. We've got it. We've got you. Uh, well, we've got electric cars. We've got some bikes for the staff. We've got some showers. We've got a great recycling. Our procurement program around paper and et cetera is good. Telling our staff not to print emails to save them you know, electronically. We've got this. And it's fascinating, right, because if you look at what they've got, they've caught the sustainable and the carbon costs within their buildings, within the four walls. And that's important, right? Because there is a, you know, lights, which I feel like I'm under, lights and, and energy and fuel consumption and all that is important, but it's the tyranny of scale. So this is a conversation I had with San Antonio. So this is the San Antonio District Council's buildings. 
in those little red squares. So they have this whole program that you can see there. So transport oriented land use and green buildings and energy. So that's, that was what they ticked. And what I pointed out to them is that was awesome. But this is your open space profile. This is the land. And even though it probably has a less of a carbon footprint per square metre, open space does, it's a tyranny of scale. There's a lot more of it. You're currently counting only the, the square meterage of your buildings, and you start looking at the orange, and sometimes you have to turn the distraction off, the map off, and you can start getting a feel for the huge amount of open space that a council maintains and the cost of that, and yet we kind of get distracted by the things inside the four walls and don't look outside, and I get it, because you drive past the rugby field or the playground and it's green and there's some trees and kids are happy, and you're like, well, clearly there's no problem there. What's counterintuitive is that it costs more carbon to maintain a lawn 18 times a year, which is like an average reserve. So when we mow a lawn, we mow it anywhere between 4 to 38 times a year, depending on what type of lawn it is. It's more expensive to maintain a lawn than it is to maintain a plaza 365 days a year. Right? Lawn 18 times a year, plaza 365 days a year, the hard space has a lower carbon footprint from a maintenance perspective. And so this is difficult, right, because it's counterintuitive, and, but this is why we've got the numbers. We know how much carbon is tied up in diesel. You can track the, the, the vehicle hours. We know the fuel consumption. You can work it out. It's not too hard. And so for me, there's a real question about why do we maintain things the way we maintain them? And why do we mow lawn so much, and why do we own so much of it? And it's really interesting because I sort of started looking into the value of this. So back, this, the lawns came from really a European you know, paradigm of, of what success looks like. And so when you lived in these urban environments back in the 1800s, any square metre of dirt, you grew food. You, you had to feed your family. And if you didn't have to grow food in every square metre of dirt you have, you flaunted it. Right? So lawns were a class-based system where you were showing you had so much power and so much money that you didn't even have to bother growing food. And that's what they were. And, of course, you know, we jump on a ship, shoot over to New Zealand, and we just roll that out. And there's been no questioning. There was no questioning of the uh, environmental impact of that, your consumption or the, the energy that goes into it, the ecological impact of creating these giant monocultures right across our landscape. We simply brought it in. And in New Zealand, it was simply a reflection of what success looked like in the home country, right? So if you're really wealthy and success looked like you didn't have to grow food in your public space, then, of course, you wanted to show people how successful we were. Um, lawns came into the US for a, a, a quite a different reason after World War II, and it was to do with cost, and it was to do with the men who came out of conflict. So there are social parameters about why we create different landscapes for different reasons, but New Zealand basically adopted this, this English paradigm. And we really like it, right? So I had this conversation, and the... The parks manager for Dunedin comes up and gives me his mowing contract. And so I took his mowing contract and we multiplied the frequency by area. Keep in mind there's a whole lot of frequencies. And they mowed, and so you could say, you know, a small city or a big, big town mows about 13,000 hectares of grass every single year. Comes at a cost of maybe 70, maybe 100 tonnes. And the frequency is between three to eight. And we don't, we don't just mow lawns, we really mow lawns. So that's my little dollar coin standing up there in, in like, you know, a, a, a berm of a river. We get quite excited. And there's an assumption, I think, about when we mow lawns and where things are nice and clear and controlled and not messy, that's where the most value is added, because that's what control looks like. But I've just come out of Texas. Don't hold that against me. But I've just come out of Texas. I've been back a year. Um, this is Harburger Park. In, in San Antonio. And this park was designed by a New Yorker. 
and it has a, a real uh, strong approach to low carbon impact of the way they've designed it and all the materials and how they've set it up. But this park has as much functionality in this park, which is a woodland with some meadows and some, some clear areas, as does Hagley Park in Christchurch, the example I just said. Oh, there is yoga here, there is camping, there is a dog park, there are playgrounds, there are walking areas, the sort of things that uh, Hagley Park has, this park has as well. So there is different ways of approaching a public space that isn't built on an 18th century English European ideal. So one of the things that Texas does, so Texas used to be, when the buffaloes roamed the plains, Texas was prairies. And so prairies are meadows. And so Texas to this day still uses meadows. And so these are public space meadows. Right? So these are big city parks where people walk and go for playgrounds and picnics. So you can see in most cases about 80 to 90% of the surface is simply a meadow. And they have snakes and they still do it. We could do it as well and we don't have the snakes. So the meadows are really interesting, and I've been designing meadows into public spaces and private spaces for a couple of decades, and there's some things you should know about meadows. So it reduces the mowing from, say, 18 times a year, and think about, for the councils that stuff, thinking about money, right? It reduces the mowing from 18 times a year to four times a year. It self-seeds and looks after itself. That's kind of exciting. It has really interesting ecological value. So instead of being a monoculture, now we're talking about, say, 24 species of plants. They also have really long root um, profiles as well. And so what happens is it slows the, the coefficient of water flowing off the land. It simply slows water down. So a lawn, a compact rugby field lawn, almost flows water as quick as a rugby field does, uh, as, as, as a, like a chunk of concrete does. These things slow the water down and it recharges the groundwater table. And there are examples where they've taken bare land, planted meadows, and rivers and springs have come back. Because simply it changes. So if you, Bramberger Park, Bramberger Ranch, I should say, if you want to look it up, is an incredible example of absolutely dirt desert land turned into an oasis through simply the use of meadows. So they use it all the time. It can be done. You might say it's not a vernacular that we, we have. I would point out all our rural land is full of meadow species. So it's not an invasive, we always use them, we just don't apply it to this context. This is the middle of one of the expensive middle of San Antonio downtown areas. So the meadows are used in the sidewalks and in people's front gardens. So it's just a cultural parameter about what you're willing to take on and assess. They also become, so sorry, so the meadows really got, they came back in about the 70s roughly, 70s, 80s, and it was a woman called Lady Bird Johnson, President Johnson's wife, that wanted to bring meadows into Texas. And so she started the Texas Wildflower Centre, and her first response was to, to plant it up. All the highways, all the state highways were planted in meadows, really because she thought it would look pretty. The outcome was, and the outcome today is, 30, 40, 50 years on, the outcome 50 years on is that Texas now has this big tourism industry around meadows. So you've got everyone from the, the, the petrol head bikers with their, their Harleys, the families doing tours of the hill country from Austin to San Antonio to look at these incredible landscapes of flower. And they keep coming back, right, because it's a natural process within three weeks, different species of flowering, and it looks different. So there's a reason to keep coming back. So it has really positive ecological, hydrological, carbon, and tourism values. And it's not just Texas. This is a High Line, one of the most celebrated pieces of modern landscape architecture, I guess, in the last 10 years. I watched them build this. And unless you're a New Yorker, you might not know, but these are weeds. These are Hudson Valley wildlings, weeds, and native plants that they've used, where they've, they've moved away from the typical aesthetic of, of uh, you know, really controlled landscapes to so these just weed environments where they accept that this is the colonial, colonizing species that would have been here and they've designed and celebrated with them. So with these sort of things, if you frame them in the right way, the community will accept them. And so generally I think we're heading, we're going full circle. 
well, actually, we're not going full circle. We just want to go 180 degrees, where you start moving away from, we moved away from the concept that the embarrassment of having to grow food in your space and in public spaces to really celebrating it again, because I think the community is starting to understand the environmental impacts of how we manage lawns. Now, what does this mean? So if you take a mowing contract, and this is the Dunedin mowing contract, and you say, all right, here right, just, I've just talked to you about a whole lot of different landscape typologies that can replace that 18th century typologies, and you say, all right, road boom, we could replace 80 to 100% of that with different types of typologies, whether it be New Zealand natives or, or, or uh, meadows. Uh, the, the typical park, I showed you where 70% of those were, were planted. So we could probably replace anywhere between, say, 30 to 50% of those parks with meadows. Um, the, the, the typical university campus or hospital board campus, let's just say we reduce the, 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 the lawn by you know, 50%. Um, and then the, the sports fields, like you know, the good old cricket and rugby, well, that's, that's, they, they don't like playing around flowers, so that's probably fair enough. We probably can't make that change. But if you take those numbers and you just add it to a mowing contract, now we're starting to look at probably not quite halving, at least a 30, 30%, 35% reduction in carbon from the way you manage your, your land. And you're looking at a saving of, what, almost $300,000 based on a standard council mowing contract. Plus you get the value of water recharging your groundwater table, ecological value, might even get some tourism out of it. So just to summarise the last two slides, I appreciate the time that you've given me. I've been thinking about this for about 15 years, and I think as, as a city and is uh, whether you're a city or a campus or a, a hospital board or the NZDF with you know, land you own, it doesn't really matter. I think the way that you can go about getting better outcomes, the first thing you do is you, you, you identify your problems and you click into your academic community. Because these guys are really good at crunching numbers and, and working out how you approach problems. And councils aren't always, that isn't normally in their mandate. But if you start identifying opportunities and problems, I've got lots of PhD students that are happy to look at these sort of things for you. So you don't have to work this all out yourself. You don't have to go back to the board table and say, look, Craig said this, we should do something about it. You probably just want to pick up the phone. So in my mind, you've got all these academic and research people, not say lying around, but available, to, to click into. And, and in many ways, they want real life examples. And so for me, this starts at clicking into those resources, but you can't do it until you acknowledge you've got a problem. And so the acknowledgement that there's carbon tied up in what you do is really key to then clicking into that academic conversation. We really, really need to start thinking about how we design and specify urban spaces. So I just showed you five profiles. You saw the carbon cost went anywhere from like, I think 1.3 tonnes per 100 square metres all the way up to 16 tonnes. So that fluctuation you could say is eight to nine times and you can design somewhere within that, that range. And so I think as a, a city, setting up those carbon specifications that you know work and, and how they work, so that you can go back to, even tell your consultants, this is what I want and this is why I want, there's really strong value in having that early. Um, the carbon maintenance and, and, and management, so I, I just showed you the, the, the mowing contract, so understanding how you're paying for fuel and carbon within the way you maintain landscape. You can easily set up those specifications by simply changing the landscape typology you accept as public space and being able to tell the story, right? So the, the parks manager from Diddy comes to me and says, well, I agree with you, but how do I tell the community that? Because they're going to say we're just being cheap. And I said, well, that's fine, but you've got to tell, tell the right story. You've got to be able to talk about the ecology and the water and the types of landscape typologies uh, that used to be here and maybe how you're leveraging off those. So you've got to be able to frame it in a really good story and then you can win that argument. But if you're going to do it just on carbon, you may not. So you need to be able to frame a, the right story. I think you've got to slow down the rate of urban renewal. It comes at a real cost. It comes at a real cost. It comes at a massive financial cost and it's an intergenerational cost. The reality is when we're paying 4,000 a square metre for landscapes. It's not just this generation of ratepayers that are paying that cost. And some of the pressure I've come across with 
doing urban design work in places like Invercargill recently, where they said, look, we, we need it to perform better than it is, but we can't spend too much because we're still paying off the last bill. Right? It doesn't make sense. We've got to slow down the rate of urban renewal. And as a designer, I hate to say that because that's how I make money. However, it's the right thing. And so slowing down the rate of urban renewal, and I think, again, designers don't like this, but putting in the checks and balances, a third party checks and balances to the design work that's happening to make sure that it's defendable. Um, and then before you change spaces, just test them out first. Just put a little bit of time, work out what community organisations might be interested in that space, what are the cool things that could revive, so tactical urbanism is really big now, it normally is in a recession. Um, start testing out spaces before you bring in the bulldozers because, again, it's an intergenerational cost. And then finally, even if you don't believe in climate change and you don't think carbon's that important, money and the cost of what we do tracks carbon. So if you're saving carbon in your urban environments and your campuses and the way that you're doing streetscapes and the way that you're managing your land, you're saving money. And then you, there's, there's these nice sort of feel-good environmental stuff that falls off the back of that as well. So it's kind of win-win-win-win. I don't know why you wouldn't do it. Um, so I think it's, it's about efficiencies and engaging in those efficiencies. And the data is floating around if you go and look for it to help you make those decisions. Firstly, I'd just like to thank all of you for tuning up tonight. It's um, been quite insightful to uh, listen to Craig speak. Um, I hope it's left a, some thought-provoking thinking in your heads as you leave tonight and think about, A, what your individual action could be, but also what your collective action can be, whether it's in your business, uh, in your organisation, in your community. Um, our next Creative City conversation is due for November. If you are interested in our next conversation, uh, please go to our website at pncc.govt.nz uh, and register your interest.